Well, I'm overjoyed that you're here. I'm astonished at the turnout. Um, like I said, I'm Nate. I, I run a school with this guy back here in Oklahoma City. It's a three campus school, two K-8 feeders with a high school in the middle. And they all feed. We're about 625 students this year and I, it very, it very much looks like we may reach 700 next year. It's sort of hit this uh, overwhelming, quite honestly, stride uh, that we're trying to keep up with, which is why my leading with Culture Talk has Skole uh, leading from the beginning. Now, behind my talk, uh, b before we get into this, is are quite a few assumptions and the first assumption that I'll, uh, that I'll offer you, this may resurface in my talk again, uh, is that there is but one culture, uh, and it is that of the church. And a Christian school should correspond, if at all possible, to that one culture of the church. So that is, that is uh, hanging, in, in some cases, uh, explicitly, in some places implicitly, uh, that probably comes as no shock to you as you look at the, the white collar around my neck. Um, but there is but one culture, and so a proper and thorough appropriation of that culture uh, is really the only way to enculturate. Uh, if, you, if you borrow from any other culture in what you do, you will in fact be enculturating something different than what has been handed down to us in Christendom. Um, so that's, that's somewhere lurking in the background. Now, to, to tee all that up, uh, I wanted to start with this notion of scole leading from a place of rest. So, I, oh yeah, I, I advance. I almost said advance, all right. I, I've also, uh, partially titled my talk now, it, it right, was Leading with Culture, and then you start writing, I'm like, no, 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 Skull Way, because that's where it starts. And then I thought, no, 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 toward a philosophy of hospitality. And there will be application at the end, but you've got, you've got to give this little preacher his front end, okay? So, <laughs> there you go. Toward a, this is a, a wonderful outdoor feast. This is my daughter and my son. There's Ezra, there's your 504 sweet pea. Uh, this is a Pentecost feast, if it's not evident. Red table runner, you've got to, you've got to have your red, uh, at all times, red bowls, of course. And Pentecost is always smack dab in the middle of spring. Uh, shortly after this meal, the children released doves out of cages and flung them into the air, and feathers went over there, and it was, it was just outstanding. But that, that's, you, you can already anticipate from that photo where this talk is headed. That, that is the culture to which we uh, aspire, because it is, um, uh, it is, in fact, the culture of the kingdom. All right. I'm going to talk out of uh, uh, Luke chapter 4. But here I, I found an icon that was illustrative of Luke chapter 4. So this icon, which was written as a, fort, a 14th century fresco, hangs in Kosovo. And this is Jesus preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth. And I, uh, anyway, was looking at this, and um, I, I think you'll see after having read the text here in a second why this is so powerful. Of course, icons are always powerful because, uh, have you guys read, have, you've read Prince Caspian, right? What happens is Eustace looks at the picture, you know. This is what our Greek brothers and sisters have been trying to teach us Westerners the whole time, right? You, the picture comes alive and they fall into the picture and they begin swimming within the realities of the picture. That's, that's, that's the whole theology, right, of iconography as taught by, by C.S. Lewis. So I want to swim in this picture with you, as it were, and fall into the sea and, uh, and swim a bit. And it's uh, uh, Luke chapter 4 that will take us there. It's always important to look both before and after, of course, when you are uh, uh, reading scripture. This is right after Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. That will matter. 
uh, as we read, and before he casts out a demon. So here we go. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Skole, 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 skole. Leading with culture. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Uh, right? So he's going home. He's going home. Go to Nazareth. All right. Uh, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written that the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then after an exchange about a prophet not being welcome in his hometown, right, he says, uh, uh, Luke, uh, the gospel writer says, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. And my favorite tiny miracle of all, uh, there's, a, I think, an old Syriac tradition that, in fact, he flies away. Either way, he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So, for him, whose compassion poured out blood and water from his side, for him whose love invaded Galilee with healing for those who lay dying, for, for him whose mercy drew tears over a rebellious Jerusalem, for him, like that guy, Jesus, there was a quality of silent, ennobling authority that passed through the clamor, that passed through the noise and the anger and the panic and the anxiety, and simply went his way. Not every moment needs your response. Not every doubt-filled comment needs disputatia. You just don't. Sometimes you say your prayers and go on your unhurried way, right? The fulfillment and the consolation and the light of the entire world just walked out of the synagogue. And he has no need of a neon sign, a microphone, or an Iowa caucus to make his point. Oh, I got it in there anyway. Anyway. Uh, I start there because if culture is to take root, we're going to talk about the kind of culture. I, I do mean a specific kind of culture. It is the culture of Christendom. I have application of what that would be in the life of a school. But it has to start uh, within the leadership. And uh, if a leadership does not draw from this kind of um, attitude, um, this kind of um, centered soul, um, this silence before God, I'm going to define this further with Joseph Pieper here in a second, then your, your culture will, uh, I mean, your school is going to smell like your administration. Is, is your, I mean, that's going to be very clear as I move through this. So, now, with, with Jesus uh, figuring for us this, this notion of unhurried uh, wonder, uh, wonder is important, right? The beginning place of all of philosophy is wonder, and we are schools of philosophy in large part. Um, but a favorite quote from Joseph Pieper's Leisure, right? The Basis of Culture. I, I believe that's a book he wrote at the end and in the, in the uh, unsettled aftermath of World War II. And so he's reframing quite a lot about education in terms of moving out of uh, ratio and into intellectus, which is the out of the, the, the discursive life of the mind to the contemplative life of the soul-centered intellect. Right? Does that make okay. So leisure, leisure, the society of scholae, right? The, 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 root, the Greek root word of school. I'm, I'm just riffing on Pieper. Go read it. It's great. Leisure, it must be clearly understood, is a mental and spiritual attitude. 
It is not simply the result of external factors. It does not matter how much work you have to do. That cannot be what dictates a life of leisure and of unhurried wonder. And therefore, it cannot be what dictates the life of your school. Um, if I am in a constant and frenzied panic, it should not be surprising to me if parents are routinely coming to me and saying, this school is totally overwhelming. You have set a culture and a tone by doing that. But nevertheless, it is not simply the result of external factors. It is not the ine inevitable result of spare time. It is not a holiday, a weekend, or a vacation. Those things are not leisure proper and it's, and it's uh, original. It is, in the first place, an attitude of mind and a condition of the soul. And therefore must be approached as all things concerning the soul are approached. Uh, 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 and you could, we, we could certainly go there, but let me, let me continue and actually get through this presentation. Followed by another, there's another quote from, from, from Pieper in his book. Leisure is a form of silence. I think of the psalmist. Uh, this is morning prayer. Uh, the Lord is in his holy temple that all the earth keeps silence before him. In, in the morning prayer that, that constitutes my, my devotions. But leisure is a form of silence, of that silence which is the prerequisite of the apprehension of reality. Only the silent hear, and those who do not remain silent do not hear. Now let's take this a step further. I have six children, my, my home is not silent, and yet it is a place of tremendous sanctuary. It, there is still, still silence there, uh, e even though Ian cannot uh, seem to, to be quiet. Right? He's my four-year-old. Silence, as it is used in this context, means more nearly uh, that the soul's power to answer to the reality of the world is left undisturbed. It is the silence of being undisturbed. The soul always and ever silent. The soul always undisturbed. That is a place of sanctuary no matter how many people are actually talking. And I think that's the silent, the deeper, uh, the, the deep down fresh things version of silence, uh, you Hopkins peeps, um, that, that he is grasping toward. So again, uh, in summary, there is something that we see in our Lord, this, this sense of having, of course, come to terms with God, for He is God, having come to terms with Himself as Son um, of the Father, and therefore having such peace and such, such ennobling authority that He passes through the crowd in this beautiful miracle. And his ministry is constituted, right, right? There are, there, it is very rare that, that he um, uh, engages ever in, in frustration. I mean, and sometimes when he is frustrated, those are interesting passages to see Jesus. Uh, but that's, that's not where he draws um, from primarily in his building of this rich Christian culture, all of which flows out of his, wife, his life, right? What, what is the Christian calendar year? It's the life of Jesus on repeat forevermore. Could there be anything better than that? Your schools should have a culture of the Christian calendar. I, I, I'm jumping to the end. Your schools should, um, should draw upon the constant reenactment and full participation in the life of Christ as it is given to us in the church calendar. Uh, you are, you are, you are put, you're putting Jesus on in, the, in, those, in those moments. All right, here we go, keep going. Okay, now, now, now let me do a bit of uh, diagnosis, right? Culture in, in the end is a way of life. I mean, that's, that's part of what I, you know, there's, you can, uh, uh, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes work that we do, that I do with, with Stephen right there, um, like building three to five-year strategic financial pro formas to support a school. If you lead with that, uh, you are going to have uh, significant school culture issues because uh, that is not a way of life. Um, 
it, it, that would be living life with a skeleton only. You've got to put flesh on your skull and let the silent and hidden things be silent. There is a reason you cannot see my bones right now, right? It would be a problem if you could see my bones. So I don't know why so many schools lead with their bones, like put some skin on already. Um, bones are what you see when something is uh, dead, right? So anyway, all right, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so diagnose this a little bit to say why culture is going to matter so, so, so much. You've got to give something. So let me diagnose a little bit from parents. Parents who increasingly feel the effects of a Christianity that is increasingly on the defensive and not entirely knowing what to do. These are all basic quotes of me having been a, a head of school for some 13 years now. I mean, I, I, I can picture the person who said this, and or five or six people, right? Parents who, in the wake of a more secularized culture, sometimes misunderstand a compulsive hyperactivity, i.e. helicopter mom. I've got helicopter dads. That is not I, I in, intended to be uh, um, overly binary or something. Anyway. Um, <laughs> who misunderstand a compulsive, uh, a compulsive hyperactivity as Christian discipleship. If I'm just doing more and hovering more heavily, surely good will come of that. Right? Uh, that, is, that is a misunderstanding, but you could see where it's coming from. I actually think it's probably coming from a really good place. Uh, I, think, I, I think I probably am more compulsive than I would like anyone to think and could probably pull that off pretty well if I actually had time to do it, so anyway. Three, this one, parents so numbed by the, very real, by the way, but nevertheless, politicization of child abuse, that they have, in fact, absolutely uh, sided with the child over and against the adult without even knowing why. And in doing so, and in doing so, they lose yet another ally and source of respite in the process. I mean, I need, I need the karate, you know, instructor, and I need the soccer coach, and I need the Sunday school teacher, and I, and, and I need my kindergarten teacher, or things are going to go poorly for my kid. I, 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 I'm, on, I'm on kind of on the side of it. I, you know, God help my child if I'm the only one influencing them. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for a rich, uh, ten-layer deep community to wrap this child inside of. And, and on, on accident, we, we, you know, uh, I, I don't, again, believing the best, we have the best parents in the world. I have the best 386 families you could ever ask for at the school. You know, whatever the number is now. But, uh, but, but they're, they're trading things, and, and sometimes in a reactionary way, without even knowing why. And I profoundly empathize with them. There's no judgment for a, for, for a parent who's experiencing this. Okay. And then finally, parents who have been robbed of the simplicity of home life, resulting in formal structures still being largely in place, right? We typically have two parent homes at the academy, though increasingly we don't. Um, but lacking the unhurried simplicity and spiritual rhythms that catalyze the home as the primary place for Christian discipleship. Several of our parents have told me that they feel as if they no longer even have time to read the Bible with their children and therefore leave it to us. I mean, they've totally punted. And they love the Bible. It's they, they, they want the Bible in their ch ch child's life. And they, so they are essentially paying us to read that Bible to their child and thinking, th and that, to some degree, thank God that they have that. Um, but that's, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. You can see so again, now I'm building, a, I built a case for why administration should have a certain attitude of soul. I now want to, to, to paint over and against that what I think is happening in the hearts and minds of our parents, and then how to wed those two together, those two uh, pieces. Now, the results of this cultural confusion, whether intended or not, is a breach of trust. Um, and, and Again, you can probably guess a little bit where I'm headed with that. How would you rebuild the most crucial thing uh, as uh, you can find these, uh, you can find trust reported in the most astute um, business journals, 
that are teaching um, uh, you know, corporate competence. Trust is always the big, thick foundation upon which they build all of their pyramids. Uh, you can find it in Holy Scripture. So, so we are dealing with a radical breach of trust and, and no one was even, I don't even think, intending it. Uh, and, and, and you can see, like, and culture's the only way we're going to heal that. Um, so, uh, secondly, an ill-advised and sometimes exclusive reliance upon the school for Christian formation, even while holding the same in constant and exhausted suspicion. Three, a growing number of administrators and professors who are completely withdrawn from the lives of their students and Families, uh, sometimes just out of being very, very nervous about what engagement might do, cost them, um, or, or, or even accusation. And then four, a wearied, unenthusiastic approach to communication and parent meetings at times. These are, sometimes these are just happening in, on, the, on the fringes, by the way. I mean, we, uh, anyway. But, and, and, but, but, you know, and, and then always, don't forget, we, we have it better than anybody. We have the best parents in the world. Uh, these things, though, realities with which I daily deal, um, I don't think anyone has um, motivated from a place of malice. I, don't th I cannot think of a single parent who has contempt for me, even though some of these uh, sweet little patterns and unfortunate patterns are, are always creeping around the edges, right? Of course they are, of course they are. I mean, we're, you're building a house, and I, I live in a 101-year-old uh, two-story bungalow in historic Putnam Heights, and the thing creeping on my house most often is foundation issues, right? right? And so I have insured that bad boy so thickly. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not going to be taken off guard. I am going to battle the fractures right at the foundation level so, so that what I'm not dealing with are cracks in my daughter's ceiling upstairs. Like, I don't want them that deep. I want to I wanna, I wanna battle them at the fringes from the get-go. And the way we're going to do that is with culture, friends, culture. All right. So, from the rule of St. Benedict, uh, this is having hopefully painted a picture of a certain attitude of the soul on the part of the administration. Now having hopefully painted a picture of uh, some of the battles that we face and a rich leadership of, of, of enticing and winsome culture drawing us in. Then my, the third part is, a, 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 is to lead first, before we even get to how culture is manifest, is let's cultivate a little bit a philosophy and a doctrine of rich hospitality. St. Benedict is the best at this. Uh, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, um, built the first repeatable and sustainable Christian school. Uh, uh, the monastery is the great, great grandmother or grandfather of every Christian school that's ever existed. Uh, you, you've got to go back to, 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 to even begin understanding the heritage that we now walk in, and, and, and um, even Nate Carr, full-blown Protestant, has got to go back here, right? So once a guest has been announced, writes Benedict, to, uh, um, to his monks, the superior and the brothers are to meet him with all courtesy of love. First of all, and, and you can imagine, by the way, I, we are not a service industry, but we are treated as one, right? Um, we are an outpost of the city of God. That's what we are. We're an outpost of the kingdom. And we have, I have 87 different churches represented at the academy. I have devout Latin mass Catholics who have yet to utter a single word of the liturgy outside of, of that language. And, and then I have you know, last year, Life.Church's Craig Rochelle's daughter graduated and everything in between, you know, I, just this unimaginable uh, spectrum of, of church representation. We're now post of that kingdom, of that kingdom, that good and precious truth uh, witnessing uh, beautiful kingdom. Uh, but you could see why um, when we live as the kingdom, 
prescribed here by St. Benedict, it goes well for those who are treating you like a service industry. In other words, a service industry, like customer first, um, which people began treating you that way when they're paying tuition. And that's understandable. And I don't, uh, I don't think that we need to spend a lot of heartache worrying about that and trying to sort that out in parents when love and charity can win the day on that discussion. Um, I, I mean, I've had moments where, where that's been hung over me as a headmaster 13 years later, right? Well, I'm a, uh, and and that's, that's not a moment to, to contest, um, in, in my opinion, um, their treatment of me as their massage therapist, uh, you know, the, sort of the service industry model, but rather to simply win the day in love. I mean, that's the, that's the basis of charity. I think St. Benedict t takes us there. Um, once a guest has been announced, the superior and the brothers are to meet him with all courtesy of love. First of all, they are to pray together and thus be united. And these are pilgrims, right? Pilgrims. They come a long journey so that they can say prayers. These are sometimes people that, that you know, the monastery says prayers all day, every day for those of us who can't because I need to go to a finance committee meeting. That's kind of the doctrine behind the, right, the monastery. There's someone praying for me at all hours of the day, day and night, day and night, day and night. So they, they, these pilgrims then come, they've taken a sabbatical, and they come so they can see the brothers, and they heal, kind of fill the soul back up, and then re-enter their vocational life. Their vocational life is every bit as important, but it's also every, every bit as different. And so they've been filled back up as, as you know, as, the, as it were. So they're to pray together and thus be united in peace. Some of these people have never met, and yet they're to be united in peace, in peace, in peace. Um, Right, Pieper says in his love essay that love, what, whatever your definition of love is, that what all definitions of love have in common is a coming together, a constant tendency towards union. The two become one, which includes marriage, of course, even in a very physical way, but is not exclusive to marriage. All of us are moving, that's right, that's the doctrine of the Trinity as well. Uh, uh, the unity of uh, the person. So. Uh, united in peace, but prayer must always precede the kiss of peace because of the delusions of the devil. We want to have a holy kiss, not a kiss of lust, so we will pray first. And then we will kiss our pilgrim, and we will kiss him, we will kiss him. So maybe you should start kissing your parents. Now, I, uh, my, the, <laughs> the holy kiss has culturally died. Um, the, the sweet old ladies of St. James Church really love their priestly kisses, I have learned over the years, but anyway. Uh, you can, but nevertheless, what the kiss represents is the self-sacrifice of agape love and radical hospitality and service to the brightest and best among us, most of whom are in pre-K. That's where the bright, I mean, the greatest among us are right there. And the parents trying to, to nurture them in such a way that the kingdom of God has yet another generation that it can once again be vindicated over and against the world and the flesh of the devil. Secondly, says St. Benedict, I just wish I could pull this off for you guys over here. Can't read it. All humility should be shown in addressing a guest on arrival or departure. Total radical humility. That's the first play, right, of of hospitality, by a bow of the head or, or, or by a complete prostration of the body. You guys ready to prostrate? Prostate? Prostrate? prostate. We're not going to prostate. <laughs> Can we cut that from the video? Uh, I'm sorry, Mom. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> by a complete prostration of the body, Christ is to be adored because He is indeed welcomed in them. Uh, to bow the head to a parent, even if figuratively, by humility of heart, is to honor Christ, uh, because Christ is indeed welcomed in every stranger. After the guests have been received, they should be invited to pray. Then the superior or an appointed brother will sit with them. The divine law is read to the guest for his instruction, and after that, every kindness is shown to him. And then finally, the abbot shall pour water on the hands of his guests, and the abbot with the entire community shall wash their feet. The stole, right? The symbol of the stole. A reminder, every priest, as they get ready, they kiss the back of the stole, and on it goes, as a reminder that, the same way the caller is, that you are, in fact, a bond slave of the entire world. You do not properly belong to yourself. 
It is a reminder of radical hospitality, which is, once again, the beginning place of any culture that's going to smell anything like the kingdom, which is why you cannot leave with corporate administrative models and end up smelling like the church. I mean, see where this whole, like, there's the big talk. Okay, here we go. So reminders, I've said this, your school smells like your leader, leadership style. If you first lead administratively, then your school culture will feel administrative by nature. Um, and uh, I don't want that. I want, my, uh, ch I want my, my school to feel like the church, to feel like uh, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Feast. And food, as you are well aware, if you uh, uh, go read Robert Capon's The Wedding Supper of the Lamb to get a, a very lively and romanticized vision of how to view all of culture. Okay? That's, should have, maybe that's on the table for Eighth Day. You should go look at Eighth Day. Is it? Okay. Okay. Yes, it made the cut. Thank you, Warren Farha, for always knowing what should make the cut. Um, uh, if feast is the most oft referenced uh, uh, metaphor for the kingdom in all of Holy Writ, then why would you not uh, lead with that metaphor in everything that you do as a school culture? And you need to come to our talk tomorrow, see what I'm going to present on like, how this shows up in a board meeting, how this shows up in a committee meeting. Like, the festive nature of life should inform everything that you do. Or you should stop having meetings. Um, okay. So, an another way to say it, kind of, a, this is a rough syllogism, right? Uh, not, not entirely. The church is joy. It is. It is personified joy. Uh, the school, therefore, must be ruled by joy, and it is joy that most profoundly forms the soul of a child. That's the thesis of my uh, book that uh, will soon come out with Classical Academic Press if I can get through the copy editing that Kevin Clark just put me through. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, stay tuned. With it will also come a breviary, uh, a breviary, so that your school can say uh, consistent prayers together, uh, and, and 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 every child could have a volume. So those those things are coming to a an online retailer bookstore near you. Maybe I'll put them in my books. I, anyway. Three, you do not lead from a strategic plan, right? Though you should have one. Uh, you should have an elaborate strategic plan. It should have m profound action items, and you should never lead from that. And you should lead with culture. Well, I'm going to apply some cultural ideas here in a minute, but I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to overstate my case just to push a little bit back on the full corporatization of the outposts of the city of God, right? And I love that stuff. Like, I, I was a, 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 a corporate store opener for Starbucks for years, opened three separate markets, had a blast. And I'm pushing back on all of it. Like, I know what it feels like, friends, okay? Uh, fourth, you do not write, oh, this is just another way of saying it. You do not lead from a policy manual, though that you should have one. And it should be a very, very carefully written one. Uh, but if that's if if your mind goes first to uh, policy, then then you are forever consigning your students to the life of Moses, rather than the life of the new Moses, who is Jesus. Right? You don't. Policy has a way of smelling like the law, and the law is precious. We know that from Psalm 119. But the law is also fulfilled, and it's fulfilled in the new Moses. And so you have to take both Moseses if you're going to get the law right, which means the policy manual is required, but the policy manual cannot be uh, the thing through which you lead. Does that make sense? You, you've got to take, you've got to have two Moseses uh, to get Moses right. Every, um, okay, we'll leave that one there. Because so I'm watching the tick-tock, tick-tock. The trivium does not represent a complete culture. Uh, a, they're language arts. Uh, um, it, well, uh, I could, uh, my point being there, before I just go, I'm, I'm about to go off on a tangent there. So we're going to stop that and just say, 
Let's just, let's just let that represent. I bet you can guess a few of you where that would have gone. Academics do not represent a complete and total culture. The church alone represents a complete culture. And I guarantee you, you can still have uh, the highest ACT rates in your zip code while next to it maintaining that academics do not constitute a total culture. Um, and, and so don't lead that way. Uh, uh, the, the book list, like ours is good. You're going to read 125 major Western classics in their entirety somewhere between 3rd and 12th grade at the Academy. Go team. I wrote half of it. Um, in, in the end, that is not the leading edge of what I am doing as an outpost of the city of God. Those are in service to something far, far, far greater. Okay, here we go. So, right, so a little bit of practical. I want our school, both for student and parent alike, to be a place of Christian hospitality for, wow, parent and student alike. Can someone please count off for repetitious? Uh, holy moly. Anybody want to guess when I wrote this slide? About 12 on 1 a.m.? Okay. Uh, we, some of these we don't need to cover right now. Um, uh, keep a box of tea. Every moment should be tea time. Every moment should be rich hospitality. Every moment filled with food. Um, uh, call first, if possible. Email as follow-up. Meet with them face-to-face. -face. You, you must meet with them. You must... You must be willing to cancel. Um, uh, um, um, and or send your body double in your place to the finance committee meeting if you have just had a student uh, entered into um, institutional care following a suicide attempt. Like you, just, you do not need to go to that stuff. You need, to, you need to run as quickly as you can. And you probably should spend the rest of your day there. And you shouldn't move. And you should, you should dwell richly with uh, those parents. You should say lots of prayers with them. You should probably cry a little because you're supposed to weep with those who weep. And um, you should not leave. Uh, you, you should feel absolutely no pressure to get back to the things that no matter what you do are always going to feel pressure filled. Because Jesus, as I led with in Luke 4, shows us how to deal with the anxiety of the world and the clamor for my attention as an administrator. And we must lead. Uh, at, where, where does Jesus go? He doesn't, in that passage, right? I put it in parentheses at the top. He goes to a child. The very next thing he does, as everybody's in there panic, because he goes to a child and heals the child. The child keeps throwing himself in the fire. And I think some probably, are, I, I think some commentators guess that there's demon possession there. And the child is fully delivered. And what are we reminded in there? Uh, that Jesus is the one who delivers even the anxiety ridden from their anxieties. That's what the healing, the, the healing that immediately follows always has retroactive impact theologically. Those who want to throw him off the cliff, there's good news for you. There is grace for you. Jesus can heal even people that throw themselves into the fire, um, much less try to throw other people off cliffs. Yay, the gospel's true, right? Okay. All right, here we go. Application at the academy, which is, uh, I will, and, and then we'll, we should have a good 15 minutes or so for questions, since I'm always a little bit more, pro let me see what my next slide is. Okay, yeah, I know what that one is. So we have a robust house system. All of our parent organization is uh, filtered and connected through the house system. You, you, you are connected to the school through a house. We have 15 houses. That's uh, really five colors united under creed, crest, and color, and a motto, and a battle cry. Um, so there's only five colored houses, but there's five at each campus, totaling 15. So if you're at our north house system, you're a house of Augustine in Blue House. If you're in the south uh, campus, that same house is called Ambrose. And when you get to our high school, they're all uh, matriarchs, heroines, patronesses. Uh, so it's Monica, Augustine's mom. And all of those children are deeply connected 
um, across the 640 square mile uh, <laughs> city. <laughs> this is why we did districting. Uh, there's this weird moment in Oklahoma City's bizarre history where they're like, we should annex 640 square miles and fill it with nothing. And I was like, maybe we should district since nothing's convenient in this city other than everything's 19 minutes away because there's no one there. But anyway, our house system is what glues us uh, together. It is. It, our, there, so it, I would even say your grade at the academy takes a back seat to your house. Those are the families in which you grow up. So they pray together, they have every day to lunch together, they say, mat, or they say first thing in the morning matins together by house, uh, though all together but under their crest and banner. They're, they're, they, they lead with their, their lunchtime, they eat together. My eighth grade son never gets to eat with any other eighth grader that's not already in his own house. And, and it's not an issue, it's not like this battle that I have with him. Like, uh, right, so, and, and, and then they sing Evensong every single day together um, in, in the same structure. There's a lot more to be said about house. We have athletic competition um, uh, and, and a dozen other things, but let me leave that one there. A house system is a way to lead, you want a huge front end on your school, a massive cultural front end. You, you want it to have a certain mystique as far as I'm concerned. It, it should be uh, uh, compelling um, uh, and, and mysterious in, in, in how to sort of enter. Because I think that's a huge and very powerful thing. Your parents like, love, or hate it are millennials. And millennials love mystery. Millennials are not at odds um, with the classics, you know, there's, there's this thought, right, that because the classical education likes right angles and, and shrubbery uh, that's perfectly groomed, I don't know, I'm picturing like for whatever reason right now, a labyrinth, that's classical, that a millennial will never fit in, but that's, the, that's a misunderstanding. Your parents are millennials, at least the ones sending kids at your entry points, pre-K, kinder, first. And uh, mystery and beauty are about all you have on your side in, 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 a, in a first interaction and hook with a millennial. Because they're, they're, they've been burned on a lot of the other um, uh, uh, personality hooks. Like the, the, the sort of just the phenomenological experience of what it is being a millennial. Um, there, there's there's a, just a couple hooks left, and mystery and beauty are a couple of them. I mean, you're not going to get them with, uh, uh, you know, moral outrage. That's not going to be like, oh man, someone who's morally outraged. Let's go to this school. Um, <laughs> though though you can teach rich virtue ethics uh, uh, in the midst of that, I, but that's not my talk. So here we go. Um, there are. Uh, some academic applications for leading with culture that maybe we can get to. Um, I want to leave time. Uh, the first, though, of which I would say is my medics. I would put my medics as a subpoint to academics. My medics are are uh, as beautifully taught by my science chair earlier today with reference to science. Actually, my medics is a way of life. Right? We are to imitate Christ. Which means that, I mean, here's the cultural import of that. Culture is a way of life. You are told to imitate Jesus, which means mimetics is your way of life. Your whole school should be a certain mimetic, um, which, which is why the first thing that any child at the academy hears from anyone is something like, the Lord is in his holy temple. You, the, the mimetic of our school is prayer leads. Uh, the first of everyday group prayer. There's a way of life at the academy that is imitative, that is required by faculty, student alike, that leads with a huge front end of, the, of, of mystery and of beauty um, that becomes, over time, patterned ways of life. It's the way that when you, you move and uh, live and have your being, I guess, to, to, to quote St. Paul. So start, don't start, certainly start viewing your lesson plans as mimetics, as, as if, if everything I'm about to say and do is going to be imitated by the next 
standard bearers of the kingdom of God. How would I build an entire school day? And I guarantee you it's not going to look like preparatory school life any longer. Or at least it will start taking steps of distancing yourself from that. So I think that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, we can get there. Okay. All, all, your entire school day is my medic and the lesson plan. The hallway transition is my metic. All of life is my met. Okay. Okay, there, there we go. Uh, fine arts, we can come back to that one as well, if need be. Um, the hours, I've mentioned this already, both in reference to St. Benedict and my breviary, but um, you, if, if time, in fact, has been fully redeemed, and if time has been fully transfigured by the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, then there is a way to re-script time uh, that if you teach a child only that time, like the world, is governed by bells, you have a very clear mimetic at your school. And your culture should be something else. At the very least, I mean, we do this a little bit, you should hang a bell and ring it, like College of the Ozarks. Um, we, we built a bell tower on one of our, to ring in um, prayer. It marks prayer. And that tone, if you do it every day for 14 years, guess what that tone will resonate in the soul of a child? I am to pray. I am to pray. <laughs> I feel like Pavlov right now, but anyway. <laughs> There's probably something there to be learned. Uh, how could Jesus transform Pavlov? Uh, uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, you must think of... So if, if in fact time itself has been transfigured by the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and the only time marker that you have in the lives of your children is that of uh, class transition and bell ringing, then you might want to rethink how time is in fact marked. And so we punctuate with three hours, hours of prayer, which is a total ripoff of St. Benedict. But guess what? The whole church is one big, huge, 2,000-year ripoff. All is well. And radical creativity within your own context will come through radical ripoffs of Christian culture. And so taking a step back and bringing that culture in will think, ah. Oh, and bright wings. I mean, that's where the spirit hovers, right? I'm keep going back to, to Hopkins. To Hopkins. I want to end with a Hopkins quote here at the minute. Okay. Travel, you should do rich pilgrimages, and they should absolutely chase the life and the heritage of the church. All eighth graders at the academy go. I mean, there's a lot. Sometimes it's like many years out. Go on a pilgrimage to Italy as part of the rite of passage. Rite of passage is a rich cultural marker. It's a way of transfiguring and transforming time. And you should do it participatory. And there should be ceremony involved. Pilgrimage is a long lost art, even among those uh, uh, in America who invented it or whose tradition invented it. You know, you know, there's, uh, Roman Catholics no longer do a lot of pilgrimage, even though that's one of the um, charisms and gifts that they've given the church. Pilgrimage should happen. I think the closest thing we have is camp culture in America. We go to camp and that's something of a pilgrimage, something of a spiritual retreat. You should take pilgrimage and then we do it again with our seniors uh, as well. You should feast constantly and you should do it high feasts. Ours look like Hogwarts and we do it by house according to feast day of the patron or patroness. Um, and then we also do Feast of the Incarnation, Christmas, Feast of the Resurrection, Easter, um, and each house sits at long, long, long tables. We do high, high toasts. Uh, we do mummers plays uh, that, are, that are acted out as well. Uh, it's a multi-course meal, and, and, and time stands still for a minute. You want children to have the experience of time standing still. Other man, otherwise, you are enslaving all of your children to old, sleepy, uh, uh, old man Kronos. Remember, he's sleeping down there. Is it uh, the silver chair where they find Kronos uh, asleep in the underworld? Um, I, if you want to enslave your children to that, I, you know, I, I just be careful. Be careful. You want, 
You want time to stand still for your children because then they'll live for that. Then they'll remember that. Then they'll want that and crave that for their own children. They'll remember uh, the wonder. Right? The beginning of place of philosophy, Plato. They'll remember the wonder of it all and, and therefore will be the Christian ambassadors that you want them to be. This is why a worldview class will never accomplish what you think or hope it will accomplish. Apart from the full participation in the life of culture, Christian culture, you must wed the right thoughts with a way of life. That's you know, there's the entirety of my talk in one sentence. Uh, liturgical classrooms, we can talk about that, how, to, how to give beginnings and end that mark classrooms as spaces of unhurried wonder. Okay, And then, uh, as I referenced earlier, unhurried wonder. Okay. Um, let me, I, rather than end with my last slide, I, all of this is absolutely 100% me figuring out how to take the edge off. But someone said, aren't you all your talks like these rhetorical ruses for dealing with squeaky wheels and, and parents? Uh, sure, from any outsider's perspective, an act of grace is a moral outrage. For grace seems to satirize the rule book. It seems to negate the importance of fairness and justice. But it is there, I would argue, that there lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And since we all live in this, what feels like a Heraclitian world, I'll also end uh, with Hopkins, for we should end any list with the poetic. So this is mimetic, right? Here we go. I'm not going to read the whole poem, but you should read Hopkins. Here's the title, That Nature is a Heraclitian Fire and of the Comfort of the Resurrection. And so Heraclitus, right, the, the, the philosopher of change, all is change, all is change. That's what my life as a headmaster feels like. That's what your life as teachers feel like in ministry. <laughs> Which is constant, 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 constant. So he goes through that cloud, puffball, torn, tufts, tossed pillows, flaunt forth, they chevy on an, on an air, built thoroughfare, heaven, roisterers in gay gangs, they throng, they glitter in marches, down rough cast, down dazzling whitewash, wherever an elm arches. He continues later, of yester tempests, creases in pool and rut peel parches, squandering ooze to squeezed dough, crust, dust, stanches, starches, squandered masks, and man marks his... And it's beautiful how, he, how, he, how alliterative he is. And he goes on and on and on, all that's changed, all that's changed, and then he yells out, enough! The resurrection. In the middle of the poem. A heart's clarion, away, griefs gasping, joyless days, dejection across my foundering deck, shone a beacon, an eternal beam, flesh fade and mortal trash, fall to the residuary worm, world's wildfire leave but ash in a flash to a trumpet crash. I am all at once what Christ is since he was what I am. And this jack, joke, poor pots heard patch, matchwood, immortal diamond is immortal diamond. So, um, the resurrection is the font. Thank you, Hopkins. Thank you, Gospel. <laughs> Uh, from which we draw rich school culture. And we'll probably leave it there. So, anyway. Thanks. Do you have any questions? <laughs> you, you alluded to a school leading um, with flesh and with skin, not with bone. Um, what yeah. does it look like if a school does lead first? With bone, what, what does that look like? What's an example of what a school uses with bone and not with flesh? So, uh, I, I, and and some of this will come out more thoroughly, I think, in my talk uh, tomorrow with Stephen Taylor, my assistant headmaster. But let me give, let me go ahead and, and cheat, and maybe give one example. If um, 
if uh, let us let us if your ed team meetings or if your faculty meetings um, if your finance committee meetings each of those is going to have a different iteration lead first not only with the pressure of concerns but with your poor inability uh, as an administrator to keep your head held high as Jesus does in Luke 4. Um, and so you look harried and you feel worn down and you lead with your um, uh, in sort of this graceless way, and I'm not even talking about the grace that you offer people, I mean the grace that you don't allow uh, to invade your own soul. So I'm not, I'm not saying that when I say that, I'm not like, you're graceless in the way you treat people, though maybe you are. But I just mean in the gracelessness with which you live life, since grace is this undulating font of the life of Christ that can be poured into your life. Um, that, that's a graceless. But, and, and so your people wear the weight of what you as a leader should filter. And you should be the one who takes the wounds of the world on the one hand and uses those to turn and pour grace. I mean, wounds are the, the way in which grace is drawn. And so then pour that grace out over your people. And this is sort of the very essence of never returning evil for evil. And so I, I, anyway, I've just seen a lot of administrators certainly harried by by the relationship with which, you know, that they have maybe with their board or, or um, and, and this is all understandable. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to beat up on you, but I am trying to be clear with maybe what I hope are some peers in the room and just say, um, those wounds must be turned to healing for the good of your people or your leadership will be exhausting. It will be tiring, and so you must fill up what is lacking uh, through with the wounds of Christ. Right? That's you've heard, you've heard that passage. And so, in a finance committee meeting, maybe it's uh, uh, always leading with the the fear of what is to come if our next fundraising event doesn't go well, and who's calling that guy, rather than, than leading with Hopkins. Like, let's just fill this room up with grace. We'll get to the concern. Of course we'll get to the concern. But I'd like to deal with the concern with a, a heart that is exploding with humor. I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to run sad sack schools. Like, I'd rather have a different job than sort of beleaguerdly uh, uh, sort of dragging through the, the hot mess of our, oh, yeah, yeah, what's up? I think another example of yeah. that idea of leading with your skeleton would be leading with highest SAT scores. Leading with oh, that's helpful. the yeah, best thank academic you. program, because that's not culture, right? That, that gets back to your earlier comment. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, yeah, that's like, as, as a home builder, going to your, your potential clients and showing them how cool your hammer is. And they're like, awesome. Glad you were like, have you seen my hammer? I will build that house. You know, I, I'd rather see a house and it's full. That's what I mean by culture, right? God, God leads in the same way. He builds a three-story house in Genesis chapter 1. He fills it. Um, and, and then the law comes. I don't know. So I, you, you build the culture first, and then we can, we, can, we can go precept by precept. I promise you. Know, so anyway, what else? I hope that helps. I don't know. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> We're done. Has this been at all helpful? I'm trying to read my audience. Or do you think this guy is out there? <laughs> that was mutually exclusive. Yeah, that's right. That's <clears throat> I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Those are not. Thank you very much, Grant. <laughs> okay, God bless you. Have a great day.